So anyways, that's why I'm not allowed to do that anymore. Huh, that makes sense. Yeah, right? Hey, for First News, I'm Chris. And I'm Micah. You got some exciting stuff coming up. Yeah, so April is going to be busy, but we're already getting things ready for that. April 3rd. April 3rd. We have a rise and run Ooh. Saturday morning. Uh, we got sign-up sheets down at a table by the elevators. Uh, normally, we do a run and a walk. This year, we're just going to do the run and um, and all that. And so, I got are, it. are you stuck? I might be stuck. Oh, so, uh But we want everybody to get registered for that. They can pick up forms, get registered for April the 3rd. Okay. Because then April 4th is Easter. Ooh. So go ahead and put that on your calendar. There we'll you go. see you at Easter. You'll need that. We'll see you at Rise and Run. And then also in April, after Easter, we'll be starting our church adult basketball league. Oh. And so I'm looking for people from the church that if they want to play, they can come see me. They can email me, chris at firstcorpus.org. And we can yeah. get everybody... Um, they want to play on the team Perfect. and have a great night on Thursday nights of playing basketball. That sounds good. Yeah. So do you want to play? Well, we're already full. Okay. Well, hey, just a quick encourager. Please remember that over on the uh, drum side of the sanctuary, that is a mask only right. section. Please take note of the, we put 72 hand sanitizer stations throughout the campus. Please utilize those. And when you're in the common area, you know, uh, let's mask up. And we are so thankful that you're here with us today. Yeah, so let's throw it to this guy for welcome. Who is it? It's me. Hey, we are so glad that you're here to worship with us. If you're here for the first time, hope that you will take time to fill out this card. If you're here for the first time, if you'll take it down to the big blue wall down by the nursery, we have a gift for you. Uh, you can also place them in the offering plate that's right out by the door. Also, one thing we forgot to mention on the announcements was next week is Spring Forward. I know that's our favorite time. We lose an hour of sleep. But I wanted to let you know, so you came to church at the right time or you didn't show up for church and it's really Sunday school or whatever's going on. So continue to look for that and uh, be ready for that next Saturday night as you go to bed. So as we get ready to start worship today, let's pray. Lord, I thank you for the opportunity we have to be in your house, Lord. And Lord, just to come as a family before you today to lift up our voices, Lord, and Give you the praise that you deserve, Lord, and know that as Brian comes and opens your word today, Lord, that we will just lean on you, Lord. Lord, that in times that we may not have all the answers, we know that you're in control. And at a time that as we've gone through in this past year, just of craziness, to know that you are there and watching over us and protecting and guiding us, Lord. Lord, I thank you for this time before you today as a family. As you continue to bless each one represented here today, Lord, and their families. Lord, we love you and we thank you for your love. It's in your name that we pray. Amen.
We are very glad that you come this morning to worship. Let's stand together as we sing Footsteps of Jesus.
this morning as we remember all the wonderful things that God has done bringing salvation to us. Sing with us.
sing together, living for Jesus. My life I give henceforth to live, O Christ, for Thee alone. Sing it with us this morning.
Well, good morning. This morning, I wrestle with how to begin because I want us to take just a moment uh, to pray. And there are many things that are weighing us down. And I, I, most of you who know me at all know that I'm fairly transparent and I just need to let you know that I'm struggling this morning. A sister church in our area lost a staff member last night, suddenly. And so I ask that we lift up Yorktown Baptist Church in their loss and the grieving that they will begin. Also need to let you know that Claire Hook is not doing well and is on palliative care. And so we pray for her and for Al uh, in this week. And then we got an email yesterday from Hewlett Glower. Many of you who have been part of our church for any length of time uh, know that Hewlett was one of our pastors a few years ago and he is battling cancer. And so continue to pray for him and he, uh, if, if you know Hewlett, he is very lighthearted about things. And in his email, he talked about how his wife in the midst of this fell off a ladder and broke her pelvis. So, and all of that that they've got going on, remember them. I do want to give you an update on Steve as well. Uh, Steve has continued to show slight improvement this week. Uh, and so we're obviously still hopeful, still praying but he's got a long way to go. And so continue to pray for him and for uh, Belinda, of course, and for the family. Uh, we're probably looking at several months before he can be back with us. And so uh, just continue to pray for them. And again, as I shared last week, Belinda is beginning to uh, feel much better and get out and around. In fact, uh, she came up this week and worked for a little while in the library uh, but again, I still ask that you uh, hesitate before just rushing over to the house. Uh, she does still need to rest. And, and uh, Stephen is here, their son, and uh, Karen will be coming back this week uh, as well. So with heavy hearts, I want to read something that brings comfort to me, and I pray that it will bring comfort to you before we pray. David, who wrote many of the Psalms that we have, one of the things I love about his writing and, and about the Psalms in general is they're basically raw emotion put to paper with very little filter, very little processing. In fact, I believe in a lot of ways, many of the Psalms were David processing some of the things he was going through. But Psalm 139 should remind us of something very important today. O oh Lord, you have searched me and you know me. You know when I sit and when I rise. You perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going out and my lying down. You are familiar with all my ways. Before a word is on my tongue, you know it completely, O Lord. You hem me in by behind and before. You have laid your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me, too lofty for me to attain. Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me. Your right hand will hold me fast. As we pray, realize the very profound reality that God holds us in his hands. Lord Jesus, we thank you that your word reminds us that we are not alone. 
we struggle, and, and I confess to you today, Father, I, I struggle right now with all the things that so many people that are close to me are having to endure. But God, I know that there is no place we can go that you are not there. There is nothing that we can possibly face that you have not already faced yourself. Nothing surprises you. And so even in the midst of struggle, help us rest in you. Give us the peace that doesn't make any sense. Paul says that passes all understanding. Give us that peace today. Lord, we lift up our sister Claire. We ask for comfort for her, healing for her. For Al, as he is there as well, give comfort and peace to him. Lord, for Hewlett and his family, Lord, we ask for comfort for them, for healing, Lord, that the treatments that he undergoes will do what they need to do. Father, that you will bring healing through that. For Steve, our brother, God, I pray for healing. We continue to, uh, to cry out to you for healing for him for strength to return to his body, for his lungs to be clear. Lord, we pray for Belinda and Karen and Stephen and CJ as they go through this and with, with the year that they have had with all the, the loss that they've experienced over the last, just the last six months. Wrap your arms of peace and love around them. Remind them that there is no place that they can be that, that you're not already there. And Father, with extremely heavy hearts, we pray for our sister church, Yorktown. Today, as they come together and grieve together, as they try to process what has gone on just last night, I ask that your sense of unity and strength and peace will be upon that family. I thank you for the ministry that our sister church has in our community. And I pray that somehow you will use what has happened to glorify yourself, to use what has happened to draw this, this family together, Yorktown together, so that they can be one unified light to our community. Help us as a sister church to be there for them in any way that we can, to encourage them, to walk with them through this process. Father, even in the midst of heartache and difficulty and personal struggle, we trust that you are here. We know that you are here. So in this moment, be glorified in what happens. Be glorified in the words that are spoken, Father, Set me aside and speak what you would have each of us to hear today. Jesus, it's in your name and for your glory that we pray it. Amen. <clears throat> what I had been led to do and will move forward in doing, and I will say that I question whether I just set this on the shelf and do something else today. But I do believe that God has something for us here. I want to begin a series on what it means to live for Jesus. We talk about this all the time. We're disciples. We are to live our lives to glorify Him. But what does that mean? How do we do that? We talked last week about freedom and the fact that Jesus said in his own words in, in the Gospel of John that, that he is the son. And, and if we sin, we are slaves to sin. But as slaves, we don't have a place in the family. But the son, the son has a place. And who the son sets free is free indeed. That's us. And so we talked about this idea of freedom and what it means to live in that freedom of, of having Jesus as Savior. And, and for us, in our mortal flesh and in our minds and trying to make sense of this, we think, well, if we're free, we shouldn't surrender to anybody. We're free. But real freedom comes when we surrender our lives to Him. We're, we're no longer bound to sin. We're no longer bound to the ways of this world. We have something better. 
And so we talked about this idea of freedom, and so now I think that leads into this moving forward and what it means to live for Jesus, how we go about that. What I wanna do, and this is a, a little different maybe approach than, than we normally take or that I normally take, but I want for today and the next two weeks after today to go through the 12th chapter of Romans. One of my favorite books in the Bible is Romans. I believe it gives us the marching orders and, and the way that we go about doing the things that we're called to do. I wanna begin, we are going to look at the first few verses of Romans chapter 12, but if you look at the very first word of Romans chapter 12, it says, therefore. That means that there was something said before that we need to remember, we need to think about. And so I wanna back up to verse, or chapter 11, beginning in verse 33 where Paul says this, Oh, the depth of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable his judgments and his paths beyond tracing out. Who has known the mind of the Lord? Or who has been his counselor? Who has ever given to God that God should repay him? For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Therefore, I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifice, ho sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good and pleasing, perfect will. These two verses will give us the platform for which we will look into the rest of this chapter throughout this series. We are to give our lives as worship. Because of what God has done for us, because of his mercy, who are we to look to him, who, who are we to say, we've given you this, you owe us. God doesn't owe us anything. He shows us his mercy. Through Jesus, he offers us salvation and life. And so Paul says, therefore, because of that, offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your Spiritual, some translations say, your spiritual act of worship. We are to offer ourselves as worship. We talk about worship, and, and Johnny does such a wonderful job, and, and, and again, I appreciate his sharing a few weeks ago on worship from this very pulpit. But worship is more than just singing. That is a huge part of it. In fact, I believe worship is, is void when we don't do that and we raise our voices. Scripture is clear that we should raise our voices and praise Him, but we praise Him with all of ourselves. This is a physical act of spiritual worship, a living sacrifice. So we live our lives as worship. We live our lives to bring honor and glory to Him, to bow before Him, to surrender to Him, and live for Him so that He is glorified. That is worship. And Paul says we are to offer ourselves as a living sacrifice. The problem with a living sacrifice is it tends to crawl off the altar. And so we have to continually be reminded that our lives are to be an ongoing, living sacrifice. And that is our worship to Him. Giving of ourselves what He has given us, we'll talk about this in just a moment, what He has given us, giving it back to Him for His glory and His honor. That's worship. And so how do we do that? That's what I want us to look at over the coming weeks. And I believe Paul outlines it here for us in Romans chapter 12. So today what I want us to focus on and, and how we do this, how we worship Him with our lives, I think there are three things that we find in verses 3 through 8. Paul goes on and he says, For by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, 
Do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the measure of faith God has given you. Just as each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function, so in Christ we who are many form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. We have different gifts according to the grace given us. If a man's gift is prophesying, let him use it in proportion to his faith. If it is serving, let him serve. If it is teaching, let him teach. If it is encouraging, let him encourage. If it is, if it is contributing to the needs of others, let him give generously. If it is leadership, let him govern diligently. If it is showing mercy, let him do so cheerfully. Paul tells us here, I believe we can find three things that are important. If we want to know how to live out our lives, to worship Him with our lives, it starts first with our attitude. He says that we are not to think of ourselves more highly than we ought. Have you ever known a person that thinks a little more of themselves than you think they should? Have you ever been guilty of that? I think we all know those people but Paul says, look, think of yourselves with sober judgment, he says. A realistic outlook. Is your motivation in living for Jesus simply what you can get out of it, or is your motivation worship? It's, it's a matter of the heart. It's a heart condition. We must learn to think of ourselves differently. Paul says with sober judgment, with realistic assessment. And he says in accordance with our faith. This realistic understanding of who we really are should line up with our faith. We say we trust Jesus, but does our attitude toward, toward our lives, toward Him, toward others, does it reflect our faith or does it reflect independence? Do we trust Jesus or is our faith in ourselves, in our own ability, in science, in government, in our own retirement? Where is our faith? Paul says we should think of ourselves with sober judgment in accordance with our faith. We must realize who we are in relation to Jesus. He is God, we are not. We live our lives with this attitude, and in a word, it's humility. Humility. And let me just tell you, if you have to tell somebody you're humble, you're not. <laughs> It's an attitude. It's a matter of the heart. And it comes with this sober judgment of really thinking through who God is and who we are in relation to Him. When we think of ourselves in that way, it's not hard to surrender to Him because we know He knows best. Micah 6, 8 says, He has shown you, O mortal, what is good and what does the Lord require of you to act justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. You've heard me say this before. I, I, I believe that's what Paul is saying here with this idea of sober judgment. We aren't to think less of ourselves, just think of ourselves less. Paul says in Philippians 2, do, not, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. If we're to live our lives to honor Him, it starts with an attitude of humility. That what He has for us is more important than what we desire for ourselves. That what He has for us is better than anything we could ever imagine for ourselves. Live with a real, realistic understanding of who you are and what you can contribute. Because Paul says each of us are part of the body. This attitude of humility helps us see how we are not the only one on the path. We are in this together. We are a family. We are a body. Paul uses this idea, and we'll talk more about this next week, so I won't get into great depth, but we are meant to be together. We were created as relational beings. We were created for a relationship with God and relationship with one another. We need one another. That's how this is designed. 
Each of us come with gifts. I'm about to talk about that. Paul lists some. Each of us has a role to play in this body. As his children, we form one body. And in order for the body to function to its potential, all parts need to be working in unison. We need one another. Jesus created each of us differently with different gifts, different talents, different passions, so that when we work together, we carry out his will. That's what it means to sacrifice and offer ourselves as that living sacrifice. We work together. We're in this together. We need each other. We complement each other. We are, if you look again on the front of your bulletins, a real community of compassionate Jesus followers. We're in this together. We are a community. We're a family. That's one of the things I love about our family is we realize this is home. This is home. I hear from people who move away. They find a good church where they go, but they say it's not like my family. That's a wonderful testimony. We're a family. We're in this together. We need one another. We'll, again, talk more about that next week. A healthy body needs all its parts functioning in harmony. And then Paul gives us this listing of of gifts, and I, I read them to you. And he says, if if you're given the gift of teaching, then teach. Encouraging, then encourage. Contributing, then give generously. I don't believe that Paul meant this as an exhaustive list. I believe each of us are given gifts and talents. His point is that we need to use those as an act of worship in unison with one another, working together towards God's, God's mission for us, His vision for us. It doesn't mean, though, that you don't pay attention all the other things that go on in the life of the family. It would be easy for us to say, well, you know, my gift is teaching, and so I'm going to teach. But don't ever ask me to serve food on Wednesday night, or don't ever ask me to work in the nursery, because my gift is teaching. Don't ever ask me to give financially, because my gift is teaching. I don't believe Paul is saying here that find your one gift and do that and don't worry about anything else. We're part of the family. When the family grieves, we grieve together. When we rejoice, we rejoice together. I look at it as, uh, let's say, an illustration of a basketball team. I I love basketball. I I played basketball in high school. wasn't very good. But if you think about it, not everyone on a team is six foot ten. Right? In fact, when I was in high school, one of the, I would call it almost the ninth wonder of the world, was Spud Webb. Have you ever heard of Spud Webb? Anybody remember how tall Spud Webb was? Five six, I believe, right? I'm six one. When I walked off the floor after a regional tournament game, Midland College was walking on, and Spud walked by, and he was here. I struggled to touch the rim. He could dunk the basketball. Not everybody Spud Webb either. And I don't even know what happened to Spud Webb nowadays, but that shows my age, I guess. The point that I'm trying to make is not everybody on the team is 6'10", and not everybody can bring the ball down the court. But it takes everybody doing their job together. Everybody needs to be able to dribble to some extent, needs to be able to run to some extent, although you watch some professional games nowadays and I don't see a lot of running. Everyone has a general part to play in all of it, but then there are also those who are specific to certain positions. And that's how I see it in the church. All of us have responsibility to make sure the family functions well. But we also have special gifts that maybe you and only you can bring. And Paul says we are to use those for the body. And let me just say something else. When you withhold your gifts, when you don't use your talents and your gifts... You not only lose the the blessing of a fulfilled life and, and blessings of using your gift, you hurt the body. 
Because Paul says we need the body functioning together. Everybody functioning together as one body, one healthy body. So we need to know our gifts and maximize them, but never think that that's all that you need to do. So if we're to live for Jesus, it starts with surrendering all, to, to humbly surrender to Him, have this attitude of humility, understand that we're in this together. Not one of us is better than the other. When we come, you've heard me say this, when we come to the table, the table is the leveling of all of us because none of us come to the table better than the other. None of us come to this room on a Sunday better than the other. We need each other. We're all in this together. And we have strengths that only we can bring that when we do that, when we function together as a family, God is glorified. So how do we live for Jesus? We do so with a humble attitude, putting others first, realizing we need one another, and we use our gifts to honor Him. So my challenge for us this morning is to realize that we are in this together and commit to live Live out His will for your life as a unified body. Let's pray together. Father, I thank You for Your Word and the way that it reminds us of who we are, but also the way that it reminds us that You have gifted us and called us on purpose, that we are here on purpose. We are part of this family on purpose, Your purpose. Help us to remember that we need one another. Help us to have that sober realization, that sober judgment, as Paul put it, of who we really are, and to approach this family, approach your throne with humility, knowing that we need you and we need one another. And in the midst of that, give us a heart to live our lives in service to you, using what you have given us to bring honor to you. In Jesus' name we pray it, amen. Just a moment, I'll have you stand just for a time of reflection. We're not coming forward right now during this season, but reflect on what God has for you. Reflect on the fact that you are here because God wants you here and you have a part to play in His work here. As we stand and sing, reflect on that. All to Jesus I surrender, all to Him I freely give.
I do want to share with you something very positive and exciting. You've seen in the bulletin for several months the fact that we've been trying to raise money to upgrade with all the things we're having to do online now, uh, upgrade our cameras, our media equipment, and I will just, I want to report to you with celebration that we've raised enough money to do that. Uh, yes. God has blessed, and I believe that that will improve the quality of what you can see online when you can't be here in person. Uh, but we're thankful for that. But in fact, equipment has already been ordered. And so we're working for that, looking towards that. It uh, will be a month or so before we see any difference. But just wanted to report that to you, uh, that God has blessed us in that way through you and your faithfulness. So thank you. Don't forget to pray for Yorktown Baptist Church today and for uh, the Hooks and the, the Glowers and also obviously, of course, for Steve and Belinda and their family as we continue to lift them up and walk alongside them through this process. So as we are dismissed this morning, may each of us leave this room understanding that God is God and we are not. I should probably stop there. But to commit ourselves to living a life that would bring honor to Him. Amen. We're dismissed.